and here we go. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is the Brain Tumor Awareness Month webinar series. Today's special guest speaker is Isabel Germano. She's the professor of neurosurgery, neurology, and oncological sciences, and director of the Mount Sinai Comprehensive Brain Tumor Program. Dr. Germano. Thank you very much for having me. It is a real pleasure and honor to be here. And I will talk to you a little bit about what I do uh, as a surgeon and what I think is important for a glioblastoma in the uh, arena of uh, surgical um, modalities and surgical um, issues. So I think that the question about whether or not to operate or not to operate uh, when you have a glioblastoma is um, kind of uh, answered. And the, the best paper is the uh, level class two evidence by uh, Stammer showing that patient that underwent a complete resection uh, with a newly diagnosed glioblastoma did better than those that did not. And so what is the difference between glioblastoma surgery and let's say surgery for some other tumors like meningiomas, for uh, uh, posterior fossa acoustic neuroma and so on and so forth. And I would like to touch on three, three items tonight. The first one is in glioblastoma surgery is what we see, what we get. Uh, in other words, when we're looking at the glioblastoma uh, right here, is that really what we see or do we need something special to focus on what we need to go after? And then the second question is, will today's truth be the tomorrow's truth? In other words, what is the truth? What is what we are told today? It, it, does it still um, make a difference tomorrow or is the landscape of glioblastoma changing so that we also have to be prepared for changes and change ourselves in the way of surgeries? And then we all surgeons all love uh, scalpels, but do we have to start thinking along different lines than just those three little blades that I'm, that I'm showing you there? All right, so let's go to the first uh, question. And uh, this is one of my very favorite paintings. This is called the uh, Duke of uh, Urbino. Urbino is a little town in, uh, in Tuscany. This is a painting from the uh, Renaissance. And this guy um, was uh, able, this is his coat of arms, was able to uh, uh, make an incredible uh, humanitarian effort and uh, put all these uh, books together. But you see something slightly different, right? I mean, most Italians that uh, you see in these paintings in the Renaissance have a nose that is just like this. And what about Duca di Urbino's nose, Piero della Francesca? You see that it's different, right? Almost as if something happened. Well, the legend goes that actually in a, um, in a battle that he was fighting against a rivalry in a town, uh, he became blind in one eye. And so you can only see out of one eye. And guess what? If you can only see out of one eye, if you have that bump in front, you cannot see across. So your vision is very limited. And so he took a stick and with the stick, he broke his nose so that he could make that little indentation. So now he can see with the one eye on the left and on the right. I think this is a great story. I'm not sure if it's true or not. I love it anyway. But the reason why I'm telling the story is because for glioblastoma surgery is a little bit of the same. We don't have the luxury to see the tumor. We don't have the luxury to see the pathology. So this is a posterior fossa um, uh, operation, and this is a very small acoustic neuroma. And even if you don't do brain tumor surgery, you can see that the acoustic neuroma is here. You can see that uh, the nerve is there. And here at the end of the surgery, you can see that the tumor is gone, the nerve is there, the vessel is there, right? So what you see is what you get. But now let's take a look at, oops, sorry, let's take a look at this, okay? And so now on the MRI, we see something that looks very white, um, and we think that this is a tumor, possibly a small glioblastoma. And uh, now here's what we see. Who can tell me where the glioblastoma is? No one, right? You cannot tell, you, you have no clue of where that tumor is. So you really cannot say that for glioblastoma surgery, what you see is what you get. And then after you find it and, and you operate on it, this is the cavity. And who can tell me if in that cavity there is still tumor or if we removed it all? So clearly what you see is not what you get for this kind of tumor. So all the way back in the, um, in the 90s, um, I started playing with this system. This is a little bit part of the dinosaur era, right? 
in fact, the long neck reminds me a little bit of this long thing. And what is this? This is uh, an optic uh, navigator, optical digitizer. And basically, in, in those days, the idea was that if we were to couple some light emitting diodes to uh, a camera and a computer, we will be able to uh, follow the surgery. And sure enough, I was the first user of this in 1993. And then it really took off to the point that, well, one, I don't have the slide after uh, 2000, but now every single operating room in the United States for neurosurgery does have one of these navigators, right? And so we went on and published and, and uh, uh, helped people uh, learning about the technique. So how does it work? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. How it works is that you put some uh, light, um, you put some uh, stickers on the patient's head or you recognize the facial features and then the cameras are on top and then you basically overlap the anatomy of the patient with the anatomy of the MRI so that when you're in a situation like this, you can uh, go on with the pointer on the patient's head. You can look at this piece of brain and I have no clue where that tumor is, right? There is absolutely no clue for me to understand where the tumor is, except that now I'm looking at the tip, tip of the pointer. I see that the pointer is here and if I follow this sulcus, then at the depth, I can find the tumor. And sure enough, I don't have to resect any of the brain because Mother Nature already prepared this path that is called the sulcus that allows me to go down. So concept of minimally invasive surgery, decreasing length of stay, decreasing neurological deficit. And if you're working with a metastatic disease, that is also evidence that does decrease the incidence of leptomeningeal disease. So a fantastic um, tool for us to work. Now, this, this what I showed you that the dinosaur neck and the dinosaur machine was part of the early 90s and now it's 2018. And here's a um, YouTube link that you can follow. But basically now instead of uh, that particular one, we can also use other ones that are called the exoscope. So instead of looking inside of the endoscope or inside of the microscope, you can just look on the wall and it's like a video game. And basically you can follow your, your tools and look at that. You can look at that online as well if you wish. But basically the bottom line is that when we use this technology, we can see what we're doing. And now I want to spend a few minutes telling you about um, this uh, trial that um, uh, and the results that we just presented at the American Association of Neurological Surgeons in um, April, uh, April 30th. Uh, this is a, a multi-center study, and here are all the centers that participated to this study. I am uh, the uh, global PI uh, for the study, and uh, Dr. Japanias uh, was the uh, uh, FDA IND holder. And what we were looking at was uh, the uh, um, possibility of using 5-ALA, which is an amino acid, to... Um, uh, uh, look at fluorescence in a high-grade glioma or glioblastoma, and we presented our interim analysis. So let's just look at what is this product and why do we need it, right? So 5-LAA is uh, part of the uh, uh, biosynthetic uh, complex in uh, mammalian, and it is transformed into protoporphyrin PPIX. This is a liquid, this is a powder that is dissolved in uh, apple juice and water that the patient takes uh, approximately three hours prior to the surgery. And uh, what happens is that in normal cell, the PPIX goes away. Whereas in tumor cells, it stays within the tumor cells. Not only that, but tumor cells are more packed than the normal tissue. So there are more uh, cells. So there is more of this PPIX. And also, as we all know, when there is a brain tumor, the uh, blood-brain barrier is... Um, uh, open and therefore there could be more of this sus substance uh, that go in. And so how does this work? Well, how it works is that you take an amino acid and this is the, the chemical formula for the amino acid and the amino acid looks just like the, two, just like the tissue, so it's non-fluorescent. And then you put it into a tumor cell and the tumor cell transforms it into a PPIX um, and retains it more than the normal tissue. And when you shine blue light on it, you see the fluorescence. And so now here we go in the operating room. This is the regular microscope. You see the, the white light. And then all of a sudden we put the blue light on and the entire brain looks blue except for where the tumor is that is pink. So the purpose of this study was to give the patient the medication 
and then to put the microscope on with the regular light or the blue light, collect biopsies, and then see if the biopsies uh, correlated or did not correlate with the presence of glioblastoma. And again, this is the pink tissue, and I'm taking a biopsy that is fluorescent and that is there, and then I do send it to the uh, laboratory, and in the laboratory, they will uh, see whether or not that is consistent with uh, tumor. And so what did we find? We found that uh, 32 out of 33 cases were positive for tumor. So this is a fantastic, really high um, number that uh, we're very proud of. And this is very similar to the results that other studies had shown in um, Europe and in Japan. And then in the way of safety, we noticed that there were no serious adverse events that were related to the compound. And there were only two adverse events that were uh, very low grade. Uh, they were mostly related with uh, skin uh, um, redness. And uh, this was because uh, the patient was expo exposed to light. So the patient needs to really be kept um, in the dark for the first couple of days. And not total dark, but not direct light exposure. And then the other thing that we noticed is that um, approximately one uh, fourth of the patients had increased elevation of uh, liver function tests that, however, were not symptomatic. And this, again, is very similar to what I've shown before in, in previous studies. So now you can see that a compound like this can really help you see what you're doing because as you are uh, resecting the fluorescent tissue, when you reach the bottom and you see lack of fluorescence, you can sort of be reassured that, uh, that you reach the end of the tumor. Now, for our study, we did not use the compound to guide in resection, and there are multiple other studies around the world that have looked into this, and more to come, I'm sure. So when we said um, that patients with uh, glioblastoma do better if the tumor is resected, what I showed you, as you remember, the first slide was a curve that said they live longer. But quality of life is also very important. And it is now pretty obvious in my practice, I've been practicing in New York as a neurosurgeon for 25 years, that all the patients that I treat with a glioblastoma, that I resect a glioblastoma, are patients that ultimately do better for quality of life. And why is that? Because glioblastomas are very, very fast growing tumor, the vast majority of them, right? The de novo glioblastoma. So what they do is they push away the the nervous tissue. They cause what we, what we refer to as a deviation as opposed to an infiltration or a distraction. This can also happen, but this typically happens with the low-grade tumors that then transform into a glioblastoma. Alternatively, what glioblastoma do is they cause edema, and the edema is stretching the fibers. So these are the two scenarios that most likely a de novo glioblastoma will, will do. And so you can imagine that if you remove this mass, then the fibers are no longer stretched, and the edema will go down, and therefore the symptoms are getting better. Can I show you an example? Yes. This is a very good example. This is a patient that was sent to me as uh, an inoperable tumor. And the reason why this tumor was thought to be not uh, operable is because it is in proximity to uh, Broca's area. And here it is in the motor area, or at least it was thought that it was in the motor area. And you can see the significant amount of swelling, right? So what I do with a tumor like this, I bring the patient to surgery. I do intraoperative uh, corticography and uh, map for uh, somatosensory evoke potential and phase reversal. And um, this is not an epilepsy case, but we also look and see if there are uh, spikes so that if necessary, we can always go back. And um, here is the preoperative MRI, and this is the postoperative MRI, gross total resection of the tumor. And the most important thing is that the patient is neurologically intact. I just want to show you this very quick segment here. Oops, sorry about that. So this is the patient before the surgery. And you can see that she has very difficulty, high difficulty speaking, that she's paretic. She cannot move the hand. She has difficulty of retrieving words.
So this is her in my office, seven days after surgery. She still has the staples, I don't shave. So there is no evidence of surgery, but the surgery was done. And, and you can see that she, So you can see that she still has a little bit of the curling of the finger, but naturally significantly improved. And also the speech, uh, she's much more fluent. She can find their words. Um, and uh, ultimately, her quality of life is uh, much improved. Now, the goals of the glioblastoma surgery are to resect the tumor, right? And this is a very old little picture that I like very much uh, from Dr. Cushing all the way at the beginning of the 1900s showing this is a meningioma, but showing that the concept was to take an index finger, to take a thumb and take the tumor out. Now, I don't think that we could do that these days. <laughs> I think <laughs> if we were to do that, uh, it wouldn't be called minimally invasive surgery, right? But this is how we start. I mean, we have to respect our, our um, predecessors. The other goal is also to preserve the function. And uh, primum non nocere in, in uh, Latin, you know, do not harm, is, it's a very, very uh, important concept. Uh, it was uh, attributed to uh, Hippocrates, uh, who is considered the uh, father of all doctors, right, who lived in uh, Greece uh, um, way before uh, uh, Christ. In any event, uh, so it is important to remove the tumor, but it is very, very important not to hurt the patient. And to me, the technical aspects for this are incredibly important. So one of the technical aspects that I really go by is to minimize retraction of the brain. What does retraction mean? Retraction means to, to, to uh, pull away, right? And so why don't I like retraction? I, I did a lot of work in the laboratory, and I can show you this is a little... Uh, um, uh, tissue that we put a retractor on and you can see this is brain tissue you can see that those neurons where the blue arrows are are neurons that are basically dying just because a retractor was on them for a few minutes so clearly retracting the brain is bad but how can you go all the way at depth if you um, if you need to go if a tumor is at depth without retracting well you have some debulking option what does debulking mean it means just like this deflate right so unfortunately what can we deflate we cannot really deflate the brain right because we need the brain but we can deflate the tumor how do we do that the way in which i like to do it is to use this um, ultrasonic aspirator an ultrasonic aspirator is a device that fragmentation suction and irrigation occur simultaneously it was introduced by a physicist, again, um, uh, almost 100 years ago. And uh, it is um, um, uh, interesting because uh, what it did was that uh, the effect of cavitation while um, investigating the damage of a ship propeller. So, so this guy has nothing to do with neurosurgery, right? But he uh, concluded that... Uh, the collapse of the bubbles created a small g uh, jet stream of water, which was responsible for the structural damage. So you go from a physicist that is fixing a propeller, and here's the guy, to then, and here's the propeller, to then use this in the operating room. And this is fantastic and has been used for a while, but there have been advances uh, on this as well, right? So um, how, do we, how do we do this, this in, uh, in surgery? Well, you have high-speed mechanical waves um, that can, uh, uh, can go through and create this cavitation effect, right? And uh, um, cavitation occurs when one of the negative side of a pressure cycle, such as when the tip is uh, retracting with sufficient amplitude and sequence, suspended gas bubble either within a fluid or a tissue are trapped at solid interfaces uh, and collapse resulting in generation of shock waves. And so this instrument is uh, quite uh, important because it can be applied to water rich tissues and we're very lucky that the brain is full of water. So it is very important, right? And so this, this apparatus can be used preserving uh, structures that are rich rich in collagen, such as blood uh, vessels and nerve. So this instrument can basically dissect and separate, if used properly, the brain from the tumor. 
What are the components? There is a very small little uh, handheld piece. There's the tip that is here, and then it connects with the body, and then uh, it does uh, 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 connect uh, with a uh, transducer. Now, the CUSA can be used in two different ways, and the vast majority of people uses this as a vacuumer. I don't use it as a vacuumer. In the contrary, I use this as a dissector. Right, and the reason why I, I like it as a dissector is because it's like a knife, but it's really not a knife, it's giving me haptic feedback. Now, in this day and age, everybody knows what haptic is. A few years ago, nobody knew. Now we know because we all play video games and we know that we can actually feel things even if we don't see them in, in reality. The CUS is giving me that haptic feedback that no other instruments um, gives me. And basically, based on that um, sensation that I get back, I know um, if the tissue that I'm resecting is tumor or is tumor-like, meaning tumor infiltrated with uh, brain infiltrated with tumors. There are different settings, right? And you can adjust those. And each person, each, each surgeon has their own uh, um, preferences. This is my own uh, setting. And here's an example, right? So this is a very large tumor. Uh, you would, everybody probably would agree that this is relatively large. And everybody would agree that this is not on the surface of the brain. It's all the way deep. And so the, the uh, old school would be to put a retractor and pull the brain out of the way and dig a hole and go inside. And again, I prefer not to do that um, because I think quality of life and deficits are much better without retracting. So you can see here my opening, right? It's very small. It's probably as big as the tumor, maybe a little bit less. And I'm holding the instruments in my hands. And I make a very small opening in the brain. And at this point, the CUSA that I'm using is used to dissect the first piece of tumor. And you can see, you can, you can see that there are very big pieces of tumor coming out. And here I will show you, these are the pieces that are coming out. So by all means, this is not used as a vacuumer, but it is used as a dissector to dissect that tumor out of the brain. And this is the brain after the surgery. So this is the tumor and this is the opening, minimal opening, and the entire tumor was taken uh, from uh, uh, below. This is the post-operative MRI. And here the most important thing is to see that the patient is doing well um, after surgery, neurologically intact. And so now I want to show you something else. I want to show you, we're going to talk a little bit about the truth. What is the truth, right? This is a philosophical question and it's probably difficult to answer. But for brain tumors, for, for glioblastoma, there were a couple of things that we were, we were um, taught in school. And the first one was the brain is the only organ that does not uh, renew itself. It says review, but it is renew. I, I apologize for that. Um, so the uh, brain is the only organ that does not uh, renew itself. And, um, and this, is, this is not longer uh, true, right? Now we know uh, for sure that that is, uh, it's part of the past uh, because there are some uh, stem cells, right? And, uh, and, and that is a novel concept. Uh, so the, the idea, the fact, not the idea, but the discovery of, um, oops, renew is still, is still misspelled. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it was a long day. Okay, renew. Now we go. Um, so the, the concept of the, of the uh, uh, stem cell is uh, relatively novel, but also is bringing about another concept, and that is the possibility that there are some glioma stem cells. So what does that mean? It means that if there are stem cells from which the, um, the neural tissue is coming from, there could be one of these uh, cells, one of these normal stem cells that undergoes a mutation and then becomes a, a glioma cancer cell. And from that, then uh, there are gliomas that are um, generated. Now, this is one of the three theories. This is out of one of the papers that we wrote recently, right? So one of the theories is that actually there is this stem cell that then uh, goes and gives um, a... Uh, um, glioma. And there are also two other theories that we need to uh, take into consideration. And one is that it could, there could also be glia that then undergoes um, 
uh, deregulation and uh, mutation transforms into abnormal glia, and then that abnormal glia gives the glioma. Or there could be some precursor cells that undergo a degeneration and then uh, give rise to the glioma. And most importantly, I think that these three theories, probably they all coexist, but most importantly, I think we have to take into consideration some other very important things, such as the microenvironment, the epigenetics, the metabolism, and the immune system. And this is another one of those things that we were told, um, quote unquote, when we were kids, that the brain is um, a, 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 an organ that is um, immunoprivileged and that there is absolutely no way that any immune therapy can be used. And now we know that this is, uh, this is obsolete, right? And so let's look at another, um, I think, thing that is uh, quite interesting, and that is uh, known as the uh, Abscobal effect. This was introduced uh, um, relatively uh, recently. And basically, uh, this is uh, a, a mechanism whereby it, it could be mediated by uh, the uh, immune system. And so in this cartoon, you can see the local radiation causes uh, tumor cell death, which is followed by adaptive immune system recognition, similar to what a vaccine can do. And that will result in secondary uh, tumor death away from where the radiation is given. And this was first um, described for the uh, uh, melanoma, in a patient with melanoma. Now, why do I think that this is interesting? I think that this is interesting because it's pertinent to some of the stuff that we do, right? So let's look at the radio surgery. Radio surgery is a technique that uh, we were uh, always told is very good for very small tumor and thus is not really pertinent for glioblastoma because glioblastoma tends to be big. And even if um, they are small, they tend to have tentacles, quote unquote, and we need to have a broader approach than a smaller one. But let's go through the step of radio surgery. What is radio surgery? Radio surgery is the delivery of a single high dose to a limited well-defined target. Um, it can be given by a, a, a photon uh, um, radiation or a linear accelerator, LINAC, or it could also go, be given by um, heavy particles, right? And here you see uh, the examples. You see um, a gamma knife here. You see a Novalis or a LINAC based um, in here. And I wrote a book many years ago just to show that it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, source uh, you use. The results are identical uh, within each uh, tumor category, right? So with the uh, LINAC um, base, which is the one that I use um, mostly, but I use all, all all of them, uh, you can see that the other advantage is that you can really shape the uh, linear, the uh, uh, multi leaf collimator to give a very precise rendering of the tumor. This is a painting um, known as the uh, Venere of Botticelli, an, an Italian. Uh, painters of the Renaissance, and you, uh, this is not what he painted, this is what we painted. We used a multi leaf collimator, and just by opening and closing the leaflets, we were able to uh, draw her lips, her nose, and her eyes. So, this is not a painting, this is an x ray, and the x ray was changed, the color of the x ray was changed by using the collimator, just to show you the uh, finesse um, that we can have with that. And why is that important? Um, uh, so I put this uh, link on uh, because if you want to watch how we do the radio surgery, this is how, it's a very short movie. It's actually done by patients. It's only uh, five or six minutes long. But my interest was to, uh, to look into the radio surgery for glioblastomas. And we published that a little while ago, right? And so if we have a patient like this uh, with a deep tumor that I operate on, and then uh, the tumor is gone. And then the patient uh, recurs after the uh, um, conventional radiation and timozolomide with a very small nodule that is uh, in the same hemisphere, but a little farther away. Why not use the radio surgery, because now this is a very limited amount of disease, and possibly possibly that radiation by abscoval effect will also have an impact on any recurrence that could be happening at a different uh, site. Uh, so this is the patient, this is our radio surgery uh, plan, and the beauty of radio surgery is that there, there is a very quick 
fall out of the curves. And then you see the patient here 19 months after the uh, uh, treatment and he continued on for more than, uh, than two years. Here's another example. And this is a 43 year old um, that uh, again, we treated uh, with a, uh, a single fraction after uh, XRT and TMZ. And uh, here you see the uh, um, uh, MRI, and this is our MRI, I think uh, a month later, but it continued on to be no evidence of disease uh, for another 18 months. And now the last uh, um, interesting aspect about being a surgeon is that we have to be humble that uh, tools like knives and gamma knives and radio surgery are very important, but there is more to that uh, for glioblastoma. And what do I mean by that? Well, I was fortunate to be part of the uh, um, uh, NOVO TTF uh, trial, and this is the abstract that we presented uh, three years ago to show that if you use um, uh, TTF with timozolamide, uh, there is prolonged um, longevity for patients with glioblastoma. And after this, the uh, equipment became FDA approved. This is one of our patients. And uh, basically, as you're wearing this uh, device that is uh, emitting a very uh, bland, a very bland amount of um, electricity, the electrical fields, what they are capable of doing is up when the cell is aligning all the chromosomes to start dividing and making another cell, the, uh, um, this um, electricity is scrambling this last process of the mitotic process and the cell cannot divide and basically dies in an in a, uh, hourglass uh, shape. And now the new thing, and I'm sure you, you heard this already, it was presented at uh, the American Society of Radiation Oncology, is that for patients that are compliant with this device, actually the five-year survival is incredibly uh, improved. And here is a beautiful comment by Al, um, and I will read it. Um, the five-year results by um, for Optum uh, just came out and they were unbelievably good. This is a large study, newly diagnosed GBM, so the results are significant. Bottom line, five-year survival rate was 13% for Optum plus TMZ and only 5% uh, for Temidor alone. And this is a major step forward. And I think that for GBM, we want to see these um, step forward and, and we're in the process of, uh, of doing it. And so I will conclude with... Uh, the phase one trial that Dr. Hormigo uh, is the PI at, uh, at Sinai. And basically what we're looking at is uh, to use a, um, a pick, uh, vaccine in conjunction with the uh, uh, TTF. Uh, so the uh, um, MTA is a, a mutation derived tumor antigen. Um, this is a fully personalized vaccine that might increase the concentration of the T cell and this is used together with conventional radiation, timozolomide, and uh, TTF. And here is uh, what is coming up next. Uh, so whereas the previous trial I'll show you um, is a trial that is currently ongoing. This is something that is still preclinical, and this is something I've been working at for 10 years. Um, and uh, this is the concept that we can use patient-specific cells to be transformed into astrocytes, and then reimplanted in the brain with uh, genes that will fight the two. So the very original work was done with embryonic stem cells, and I did this because in those days we still did not have the cell technology that we have now. But basically the concept was um, that I would take uh, cells um, uh, from the... Um, embryonic, uh, uh, from the embryonic uh, status, from the uh, inner cell mass of the blastocyte, putting them in a Petri dish, and then uh, add uh, the uh, various factors that will make them differentiate from an embryonic stem cell into an astrocyte, and then load this astrocyte with um, pro-apoptotic gene, killer genes, and then implant it back. And, and we did so. And we showed that actually the tumor in mice uh, did uh, shrink. So this is just a little cartoon to show you that when you have embryonic cells, clearly they are totally potent and they can differentiate into nervous tissue and into all the other tissues, right? And now we moved along with cell technology and we have what we call um, human-induced pluripotent stem cells, which means that we can take a skin 
uh, cell, a fibroblast, and then put these uh, cocktail of genes that will reprogram this uh, cell into almost an embryonic stem cell or at least a pluripotent stem cell. And then uh, we can uh, tell this cell what to do. You can make lungs or make the heart or make the brain and reimplant it in the patient. In my case, I don't want to quote unquote make another organ, remake the brain. But what I want to do is take that cell and re-implant it in the, uh, in the brain. And the cell it is patient specific because it comes from the patient himself with genes that are killing the tumor cells. And as I said, this is a preclinical, so I cannot tell you that it will open tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, because there are a lot of, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, further steps uh, that have to be taken before this is uh, um, in the clinical trial. But it's getting very close, and I'm very proud of this work. And so here's uh, the paper that uh, we published showing the cells that I described to you uh, that are coming from uh, the skin and that are brought back to be uh, embryonic-like and then differentiated into the um, astrocytes. Um, so a tremendous amount of work and these cells are migrating, they're moving around uh, freely to the brain and we can switch the production of the uh, killer gene on, gene on and off, which was another major step to overcome. So I wanted to thank you for um, your attention. And if there are questions, I will be happy to take the questions. Thank you. That was very informative. I was especially impressed with that uh, amazing video of the patient before and after the surgery. Um, it's good to see that things like that can happen. We, have a, few, yeah, we have a few questions. First, uh, is the 5 ALA available yet? Ah, very good question. So the 5-ALA was FDA approved uh, last uh, spring. So it was uh, June or May 19, I'm sorry, in 2017. Uh, however, it is not commercially available yet in the United States, but it is FDA approved. I think I heard that it's going to be available soon, possibly even this month. Right. So you're asking me if today you can buy it, and no, the answer is no. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but just like you say, it's moving closer and closer. It is definitely FDA approved and has been FDA approved since uh, uh, May, June 2017. Mm -hmm. Okay. What would you say is the standard uh, of care for a newly, a newly diagnosed glioblastoma right now? So the standard of care is a resection. Um, if possible. So clearly, if we're looking at a tumor that is uh, widespread throughout the brain, which is usually not the case, um, the resection is the best uh, possible thing to do for two reasons, three reasons. Number one, to decrease the tumor burden. Number two, to ameliorate the symptoms. And number three, to have sufficient tissue to do all the genetic testing. And if the patient wants to participate in one of these vaccine uh, trials. After the uh, uh, glioblastoma is removed, within uh, two to three weeks, we uh, start um, XRT and TMZ. Uh, we use uh, 5940 centigrade uh, for the amount of radiation, and we use uh, concomitant timozolomide. And then we wait for four weeks, and then we start the timozolomide uh, cycles and continue on with those. Uh, so that is the uh, standard of care for a newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Um. Would you say entering a clinical trial after the radiation is better than the standard, or would you do the standard first and then do a clinical trial at recurrence? Very good question, right? So I think that it's like a little bit like investing. There are some people that are um, risk averse and some people that are less risk averse. So if you want to go for what has been proven to be beneficial, definitely go with the standard of care. With that said, there are some trials where you get the standard of care plus. And so those trials in my mind are very uh, interesting and, and, uh, and uh, very uh, appealing because the worst that could happen is that you're not getting the new substance, but you're still getting the uh, standard of care. Do you think that in the future as treatments get a little better, we could avoid the radiation part? Or is that gonna be always needed? Well, so for instance, uh, one thing that we're looking at now is to do in situ radiation. You know, as, as the, the in situ radiation has been a little bit like a pendulum. Um, all the way in the old days, we were implanting uh, iodine uh, radioactive uh, seeds. And now there is the possibility to implant a very small device and deliver the radiation intraoperatively 
um, and that and that is it. So I think Al, that, that you are absolutely correct. It is possible that this conventional treatment of delivering 28 fractions over so many days uh, might not be the standard of care anymore. Okay, and patients tell me sometimes they would get a biopsy first and then the following week have a craniotomy to remove the tumor. Why don't they just do both at the same time? I agree. <laughs> okay, yeah, that never made sense to me. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, you know, I, I, anybody, I mean, different, different theories, but I always, I always do the craniotomy up front, yeah. Okay. I think uh, that there are some cases where you can possibly suspect that this is a lymphoma. And if the suspicion is really high, and if your neuropathology service is not good, then maybe you can break it. But I would say that this is the exception and not the rule. It's much harder on the patient. Yes, you know, I agree. Worrying about it the night before is the worst part. Yeah, and <laughs> also there, it twice. Is, there is more risks involved because the risk of a bias is the same as the risk of a craniotomy. So. Okay, we see a lot of advertisements for proton beam radiation. You briefly mentioned it, and you said they were all relatively similar. Uh, so you're saying proton does not have a big advantage or does it? So they, they are, so what I said, probably I misspoke. I said um, the gamma knife or the gamma radiation and the Linux based uh, devices such as the cyber knife or the through beam or the Novalis are the same. And that was the book. For um, proton is different because the heavy charge particles tend to be, um, to have some advantages over tumors that are invading the uh, um, bone. And for instance, for skull-based tumors, they might have some advantage. When I say they might, it's because there is new evidence in the literature that even for tumors that historically were thought not to be sensitive to the other radiation like uh, uh, chordomas. Now there are papers showing that the uh, actually success rate of proton beam um, versus uh, a, a LINAC-based radiosurgery is very similar. So I think we have to stay attuned on, on this. Um, but definitely for glioblastoma, I think that the... Uh, the uh, um, gamma knife and or linux based uh, radiation is the best. Okay. Um, other countries like Germany and uh, Japan have carbon ion radiation. Mm -hmm. um, any advantage to that? Yeah, I don't have uh, first hand experience on it, so I can't quite uh, comment. But again, it seems to me that Europe and Japan are always ahead of us. So for instance, for the 5ALA, I showed you that um, I ran the, uh, the, the clinical um, trial here in the United States, and this is 10 years or, or 15 years uh, after the substance was already used sure. in Japan and in Europe. So we are always a little bit behind here for a good reason, for a good reason, because I think that the FDA wants to be sure that we're protecting patients from substances that could be dangerous. That's true, but I think sometimes they're too cautious, especially with like a glioblastoma. You know, we don't have the time and we're willing to take a higher risk now so I don't see why they're stopping us. Anyway, another question is, for some of the vaccine trials, they require that you have a specific HLA blood type. Why would that matter for a vaccine trial? Okay, so here's a slide that I have on that. Um, I'm not, a, an, uh, so uh, let's see, I'm a neurosurgeon to start with. And then uh, my uh, specialty within uh, neuro-oncological science is really cell-based uh, therapy and um, uh, proprioptotic genes. Um, but, it, but I can explain, I try to explain this, right? So, for, so in the tumor, there are uh, tumor-associated uh, antigens and tumor-specific antigens. And what is the um, HLA? L um, HLA helps immune uh, system uh, distinguish the body's own proteins from those that are made by the tumor or the viruses. So if you have a restriction, and this is a major histocompatibility complex restricted antigen recognition, right? So a given T cells can interact with both the self-major um, histocompatibility complex and the foreign peptide that is bound to it that will recognize and respond to the antigen only when it is bound to a particular MHA molecule. So this is why the... Um, uh, vaccines usually require restriction because they are more targeted in a sense. I, I don't know if it made sense, but I, I, I try my best to explain why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so basically, you want to be more targeted as opposed to be uh, broader, right? And the disadvantage of being targeted is then, then you have a very small amount of patients. 
So for instance, the one that we use, which is the MTA, it's much broader, but then, but then again, um, you have some disadvantages. So there is nothing that is always only good and or only bad, uh, but the a HLA restriction is just for that very reason from the cartoon that I showed that you, you have more, um, you, you are more focused, you're more, you're sharper in the attack. Okay. Um... Other than your trials, do you have any other favorite clinical trials that are going on right now? Oh, yes. We have um, quite a few trials, you know, that, that are um, ongoing that are all called adjuvant uh, uh, trials. And they're all looking at the different uh, uh, compounds. I, I forgot to put them on the slide, but uh, uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, one that is called um, an open label multi-center study of um, INO5. 401 and 9012 delivered by electroporation in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, so th th this is uh, one of those where immunomodulation is um, uh, quite important, right, in patients with newly diagnosed uh, glioblastoma. And then uh, we also have uh, one that is looking at uh, transodium uh, uh, crocetinate uh, TSC with radiation therapy and uh, TMZ. So this is another uh, interesting trial that looks at the patients that cannot have a, re a resection or don't want to uh, go through a full resection. And then for MGMT uh, methylated patients, uh, we uh, uh, collaborate in the uh, studio of, uh, in the study, sorry, of the uh, uh, Viliparib or placebo combined with uh, uh, TMZ um, and uh, XRT. So this is one of those trials where I was telling you before, where you basically get this gold standard plus, right? So either you get the, uh, the Liparib or you don't get it, but, but that's it. And then for the refractory glioblastoma, uh, we have quite a few. And I think that probably uh, rather than reading them through, which would be quite uh, <laughs> tiring, is just to go online. And I can also provide that link to you so that you can- Okay, you know, I'll post that online later. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Yep. Okay, we have another question. Yep. Um, how many cycles of timazolamide do you usually use? Some places use six, some say 12, some say two years, some say forever. Yeah, Strange. right? So it, it is, it is. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll try to explain why. So when uh, the study was done, um, was done with the six cycle. So the, it, it is basically FDA approved for six cycle and the study is for, um, was done for six cycle. But there was never a study that did it for 12 cycle or 24 cycle. So we do not know. It's a little bit like the parachute study. Are you familiar with the parachute study? No. No, okay. So this is one of my favorite studies. So it has never been studied. Um, the safety of jumping out oh, of yeah, I did that. <laughs> with or without a parachute, yes. right? Uh, we all believe that if you don't have a parachute, you will crash, but nobody has ever done the study to take 10 women or 10 men, throwing them out of the airplane without the parachute and 10 with the parachute. So this is, this is a, <laughs> a, a very difficult thing, you know, because if something is published with six cycles, you only know up to six. So in Canada, Canadian medicine is very regimented. They only approve six and then they stop. Whether or not if you continue to 12 or to 24, when you take a break, I think this is when um, you really see that medicine is a science, but it's also an art. And uh, it's impossible to, for me to really um, give a clear guideline on what to do. I think you, you just discuss it with the patients and other things as well. Okay. For recurrent glioblastoma, if you do a surgery and remove the tumor and do nothing else, how long would it take before that grew back, basically? Very Is interesting. it inevitable for it to grow back? Um, I think it's very close to 99% um, that grows back. Yes. And it grows back super fast. And unfortunately, this is not a parachute study. This is sometimes patients that cannot go through the radiation and chemo and the TMZ for other reasons, uh, right? They have a systemic issue and or um, they don't uh, come back to follow up and or they go out of the, of the country. And we see that the tumor grows back within weeks. Okay. Uh, you mentioned MGMT before. Could you just briefly uh, discuss what MGMT means? 
Yeah, so this is a um, methylation of um, an enzyme that if is uh, present, uh, uh, gives the tumor cells more, there is more of a possibility for those tumor cells to respond to timozolomide. So timozolomide is an alkylating agent and alkylating means that is uh, basically adding uh, a piece um, to, to the uh, uh, DNA that then uh, prevents that cell from dividing and continuing on and, and being a potent cancer. So for patients that have MGMT methylation, um, the, the original study that was published in New, Unger, New England Journal of Medicine shows that those patients tend to do better and therefore um, timozolomide must be given. Now with that said, for patients that are not MGMT methylated, we still give the timozolomide, but we know that typically they tend to respond less. And so I'll going back to your original question, which was if you have a newly diagnosed glioblastoma, would you or would you not enter a clinical trial? And I think that the MGMT methylation status is very important, right? Because if you are MGMT methylated, then I think that the gold standard is really good. If you look at those results, they, they really look good. If you're not methylated, maybe then is when um, you, you have more of an incentive to um, enter a trial. Oh, that's a good response. Um, can you talk about a Vastin? At some places that you go, you get a Vastin up front. Some places you get it at recurrence, and some places won't use it at all. Yeah. That so seems Avast strange. Yeah, so Avastin is not approved for the Novo GBM. For, uh, for a newly diagnosed GBM, it's only approved for recurrent. The trial was done and it failed, so it's only good um, when the uh, tumor, when the glioblastoma recurs. Okay, um, if you have an acoustic neuroma, some places would treat it with stereotactic radio surgery and some with surgery. I know you have both methods, so you're like the perfect person to ask. How do you decide whether to use surgery or stereotactic radio surgery? This is an excellent question, excellent question, because as I showed you, the, the, the surgery for acoustic neuroma is very beautiful and you can see everything. Um, but the, uh, the data for that, uh, for the um, surgery are a little, a little scary in the sense that you really wonder um, what is there to gain because we've gotten so much better with the radio surgery uh, that it's hard to beat it, right? So... Um, my, in my group, uh, what we look at is um, size. And so if the tumor is three centimeter or more, um, it's usually indicated unless there is, there is some sort of uh, uh, systemic problem, but it is indicated to uh, perform surgery. Now the pendulum has been uh, swinging toward less aggressive surgeries, especially in people that are uh, in the 70s or 80s. So instead of spending 15 hours trying to remove every single molecule of that tumor, I like to deflate, just like that balloon that I show you, deflate the tumor, and uh, make the, tumor, the surgery minimally invasive, um, shorter, have the patient walking out of the hospital, no cranial nerve deficits. Now, if the tumor is a centimeter or less, I think that radio surgery is um, superior uh, because there are none of the downsides of being in the hospital, the possible side effect of the surgery. The only thing that the radio surgery that I specify to the patient is that with radio surgery, you have a 50-50 a ballpark, 50-50 chance over a lifetime to lose hearing, right? So you don't lose it the day that I treat you, but you will lose it eventually, 50-50 chance ballpark. Whereas with surgery, if you look at some of the statistics, especially for those neurosurgeons that only specialize in, um, in uh, acoustic, uh, chances of preserving hearing in a patient that has perfect hearing with a tumor that is very small are higher than 50-50. So that is where there is still, in my mind, there is still a little bit of a, of a uh, um, discussion, but clearly not across the board. So those results are just in the hands of probably a handful of very senior experienced neurosurgeons that have done that as the bulk of their practice for all their life. So overall, I think that um, radio surgery for acoustic is uh, a very good uh, uh, treatment and uh, we will see it more and more. When you say they lose the hearing, is that on both sides or just one side? No, just the, just the, 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 where the tumor is. So people can lose hearing even if the, there is no surgery or no radio surgery, right? Just by virtue of the tumor being there, they could lose hearing. Um, but um, but in, in, again, in a few series of very few neurosurgeons, they show that if the tumor is small and the patient had perfect hearing, they're able to spare a hearing more than with the radio surgery.
Okay, and the last question, we're running low on time. Where would Optune fit into your treatment plan? Oh, I, sh I show you, right? So yeah, so we use it. Um, and, uh, and so, um, it's up to the patient to decide, you know, the, the comment that you made is fantastic. The fact that five years, uh, survival is impressive. Um, and I think that, uh, a lot of my patients prefer to use it right away. A lot of patients feel that they want to go until when they see some radiographic, uh, progression and then, um, and then they start then. Uh, so it is FDA approved for newly diagnosed. And we were part of the trial, so very proud of that. <laughs> um, actually, there's a better quote that came out more recently, that if you use a device 90% of the time, the five-year survival rate is 29%. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it is it is Compared fantastic. to 4% in the control group, which is a huge difference. Yep, it's fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was very enlightening. And with that, everybody, thanks you. Thank uh, you so much. That concludes our webinar for today. Tune in next week, and we'll have one on Sunday night. All right. Next Thank week's you so guest much. is Dr. Henry Friedman from Duke. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Pleasure. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.